Uh, Happy New Year, Anne. Happy New Year. Uh, has it started off well for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I got home from my trip, unpacked, and uh, then we were broadcasting Ask Eddie, so I did the commentary. So finally, like, I'm in bed a little late, and... I get to bed and cat pee because Emily is peed in the bed while I'm gone. So I had to pull like all my sheets off, throw them in the hallway. I, like, Not pee. good. Yeah, I found some dirty sheets, <laughs> like my sheets from the laundry and some Afghans, you know, went to sleep. And then the next morning I couldn't work out because I had to take care of my laundry. And then it was nice because it was like a half day at work. And then I had to take my ex <laughs> to the emergency room. <laughs> Okay, so an exciting uh, start or, or end of the year, whatever. And is, and is that the guilty party there that peed all in, in the... No, 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 because that's Charlotte. Charlotte doesn't oh. do it. It's Emily because she's on uh, Flexitine, which is Prozac, and Brennan was having problems pilling her. So that's kind of what will happen if she doesn't, if the anti-anxiety meds mm. don't or mm. get out of her system. I I get it. I get it. Well, I had a, I had a, uh, I hope everyone uh, who watches our show here uh, had a very happy holiday and a, and a good start to the new year. Uh, mine was extremely low key, uh, which is good. That's how I prefer it. Um, so we're just ready, ready to start fresh, trying to, you know, conserve my energy and get, get well and, because, you know, uh, if I get out of January not yeah. sick, I feel like it's a triumph because I always get sick uh, doing, you know, doing Noir City. Uh, yeah. It's just a tradition. And, of course, during COVID, uh, there's even more to worry about. So yeah. we'll we'll hope for the best. Yeah. Anyway, would you I'm like to? I'm looking forward to Noir City. So am I. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. It's been, uh, you know, it, it's a little difficult to get back in the swing of things. Not only, not for us, we've been doing this for a while now, yeah. but um, <laughs> but for some of the, the uh, archives and studios who are providing us with the films, it's it was a slow start for them. Let's just say that. <laughs> Okay, so shall we shall we do it? Let's do it. So question number one is from Dave and Fiona. As something of a bon viant, do you have recommendations for bar shopping in Oakland during North City 20? My wife and I would like to party like it's 1948. Well, I'm a <laughs> teetotaler, but the wife would appreciate your guidance. Oh, that, that's a shame, Dave. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> and you did say bar bar shopping or bar hopping. Well, it was bar, it, bar hopping. It's right? bar shopping, but you probably meant bar hopping, I assume. Because if you're doing bar shopping, I don't, I don't. Are you looking to buy a bar? Or are you <laughs> looking to? Uh, but I'm, I'm going to assume it's bar hopping. Yeah. Uh, well, geez, if I start giving away the good bars in Oakland, then everybody's going to go there, and then I won't get in during the festival. So maybe I should keep some of them a secret. But, um, I, um. There are some nice places that I like to go to around there. There's some there are some upscale bars in the immediate area of the Grand Lake Theater. Uh, most of them are attached to restaurants. They're not just standalone bars. And so that doesn't really constitute bar hopping, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, the alley up the street from the Grand Lake is is uh, the one of the great I don't I hesitate to call it a dive bar, but it's one of the great bars. It has a, you know, piano bar and a, a Rod Dibble on the piano had been a fixture there forever. Uh, it's pretty fun, pretty fun place with a, a lot of regulars there who probably won't be attending Noir City, but it's a welcoming place. If the Noir City crowd were to fall in there, that'd be fine. There's a place called the Libertine that is uh, not exactly my crowd, uh, there's another divey bar around the corner uh, that, uh, you know, towards the freeway uh, from the theater. The name escapes me right now, but I have spent I've spent some time in there as well. Uh, and then the, the great thing that for people to know who are unfamiliar with the neighborhood, 
is the Grand Lake sits at the uh, intersection. It's above um, Lake Merritt, and it sits at the intersection of Lakeshore and Grand Avenue. So the district is more than just Grand Avenue. If you walk mm-hmm. down the street, when you come out of the theater, if you go to your left and go one block down, there's a whole other business district on Lakeshore uh, that also has a lot of bars and things. And, and you know, if I don't know if Dave and Fiona are how much time they're spending or where they're staying in Oakland, but there are a lot of other uh, cool bars in the downtown area. Uh, when you get away from the lake and more into downtown Oakland, uh, there's some really nice bars. Um, and of course, if you're making it a, a if you're from out of town, uh, you might want to try to pay a visit to Heinold's uh, Last Chance Saloon uh, in Jack London Square, uh, which is the bar in Alias Nick Beal. Uh, I mean, it's modeled on the bar in Alias Nick Beal is modeled on that bar, which was a famous uh famous place has been around for forever jack london used to drink there made it kind of famous the bars in the sea wolf and some other things so and it's tiny it is it's the smallest bar in the world i i think it is the smallest bar in the world and and the floor is uneven and the bar is uneven which is oh i've heard of that i've never been which is all why it's the basis for the the waterfront dive in (laughs) alias nick beal where you know, Nick set up his uh, all his clandestine rendezvous were in this bar. So that that's that's about the best I can do for you at the moment. That's, that's a lot. Uh, OK, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you think so. OK. <laughs> uh, OK. For our second question, Cindy uh, says that she is high risk, so she cannot do indoor events. Uh, and she wants to know if we'll ever do a streaming film noir festival. We did one at the height of COVID, Cindy, uh, in cooperation with our friends at the AFI in Washington, D.C. We did an international festival that was streaming. And I can all but guarantee you that if we do one of these again, it will also be another international festival because it's just so much easier to get the streaming rights for those films than it is to get them for films made in the United States for, uh, for what should be pretty obvious reasons the the you, it's not that easy to do a streaming festival because so many people are now clutching film titles, thinking there must be a place for this on a streaming service. And of course, uh, if we were to do a streaming festival, it, it, we would charge money. Yeah. For the privilege of streaming stuff. So it's not like where you can upload a film to YouTube and and watch it. You know, I mean, we we have to do it through a service that could actually collect the money for doing it. And at that point, um, the rules just get very sticky. And, you know, it's it's different whether you're showing a film in a theater, whether you're showing it on broadcast television and whether you're streaming it, the rules are all different. And it, and it, it's, if you can do one, it doesn't automatically mean you can do the other. Yeah. So it's certainly not out of the question. Um, but I will always treat streaming as an adjunct to the live shows because part of the mission now is to keep the movies on the big screen. Yeah. And so while I'm sympathetic to you, Cindy, for, for, uh, you know, being susceptible and not being able to do indoor events, um, it's, it's also not the kind of thing where, well, let's just switch it all to streaming because I don't want to, I don't want to cannibalize the audience. If, you know, if, if people think they can just watch it streaming, then they won't come to the venue and it'll defeat the whole purpose of the festival. So. Um, that's what I can tell you right now. It's certainly not out of the question, but as of the moment, there are no plans to do that. My real hope is that, you know, we'll finally get COVID out of the way and that people can return to the theaters. You know, we have, we have Noir City here in the Bay area coming up and we have Noir City in Seattle 
on the schedule. We will probably be back to doing some of the other usual festivals as well this year. So that's that's where we're putting our uh, our effort. Hey, and this is from Rob. Why is it Force of Evil more more readily available in the United States? Um, it used to be. I mean, it was it was not a difficult film to find. Um, and I know that it was recently uh, released on Blu-ray by I think it was Arrow in uh, in the UK. Uh, released it as. I think it was part of a box set, but I think you can also get it individually. Uh, so it's not impossible to find. And I'm, I'm just curious. I'm always curious what, what people mean by readily available, whether they mean to see or to buy. Because I'm not sure, but I know that crit the Criterion Channel recently did a, a whole... Uh, package of John Garfield movies and unless I'm mistaken force of evil was was in that so there you go you know a streaming service that is offering it and the, you know the great thing about criterion is when they do these things they they leave them up for a pretty good amount of time right where you can you can check in later you know and bookmark it and come back and watch it later so um I I don't know the answer. I don't think it is not available. If that makes sense, <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think you can. I think you can get it. And if you haven't seen the Arrow uh, edition on Blu-ray, I I highly recommend it because they do a really really good job. Yeah, and I think Arrow has a, a streaming channel now. I think. Do they? I think so. Yeah, I could be um, wrong. Um, interesting. I didn't know about that. We'll check that one out. Um, okay, Joseph uh, notes that he was uh, he was visiting Italy recently, lucky guy, uh, and happened to catch Black Tuesday at the uh, Il Cinema Ritrovato Film Festival. Uh, and yeah, it was part of a series of films directed by um, Ugo Fregonese, the, which he refers to as neglected director. Not anymore, now that they've done a retrospective of his films in Bologna. Uh, Joseph found this film to be a revelation and a beautiful print. Um, like most uh, noir students, he'd only seen the film in a totally execrable, co ex -execrable copy. Um, bonus points for using that word. Uh, chances of a Blu-ray release is what Joseph is really asking about. Uh, exponentially better than before that festival, because I know for a fact that my uh, colleague, Asan Hushbach, uh, who is one of the programmers for Bologna, uh, was extraordinarily diligent in making sure he got a copy of Black Tuesday to show there. And I'm, since most of the films that are shown in Bologna are restorations, I, I'm assuming that somehow they figured out how to get a new print of that film, which, mm -hmm. um, which I showed many, many years ago at the Egyptian theater in Hollywood and, and then was surprised that it just disappeared. I'm not sure we showed a really good 35 millimeter yeah. print. It's a beautiful looking movie. I don't know if you've yeah. ever seen it, but uh, Stanley Cortez did the cinematography. Well, didn't and you show it at North city? I showed it. Uh, I don't believe I've ever shown it in the Bay area. I showed it in oh, Hollywood. Okay. That's what it was. Uh, and, and when I went back to, book the film again because we thought about showing because we've shown some other Ugo Fregonese films including one that was shown in Bologna this this past summer called A, a Penison Delinquente uh, Hardly a Criminal which is a really really terrific movie that that the Film Noir Foundation has preserved not restored but we have preserved it and um you know, but we when I went back to show Black Tuesday, we couldn't find a print and nobody okay. was sure who had it or who owned the rights to it. Or, you know, it was very, very confusing. So credit to uh, Esan for coming up with that print, which I'm. You know, all of all of the. Um, the guys, uh, I don't mean to say guys, all of the folks who run DVD companies like Flickr Alley and Peter Becker at Criterion and the folks from Arrow and 
uh, everybody goes to Bologna to see mm. what's, what has been restored that they can perhaps uh, finagle it onto Blu-ray or something. So uh, Brett Wood from Kino Lorber, uh, I'm sure that that somebody has their eye on Black Tuesday to to you know get it released on Blu-ray. Long, long answer to your question, Joseph. But yes, I'd say the odds are pretty good. Okay, and this is from Steve Mick. I know it's a great uh, prescient movie, but is a face in the crowd considered noir? It seems to have all the elements, but I don't hear it identified as one. To bolster the case, there are parallels between the plot of A Face in the Crowd and Nightmare Alley, although without, of course, Helen Walker as my favorite film, film fatale and noir. Follow up, Andy Griffith, like Fred McMurray in Double Indemnity and Raymond Burr in almost any noir he appeared in, pa packs a special punch to do the roles they performed later in their career. Are there any more obscure performances you relish because they were playing against type versus later roles that you enjoy? Hmm. Interesting question. I, so there's a couple of things there. So number one uh, is just the question about a face in the crowd being a, a film noir or not. I, I tend to not think so. Um, I mean, it's similar to other, you know, it. I guess, you know, look, I showed uh, All the King's Men mm -hmm. um, yeah. at this last festival just because it felt, felt because it fits so well with the theme of the festival that they tried to warn us. And you could certainly, I could have shown a face in the crowd uh, yeah. and it would have fit right in, you know, um, media demagogues and things like that. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it has a noirish kind of feel to it, but I, for whatever reason, I just don't, I don't think of it as being a film noir. Um what I am excited about is before COVID hit, there was, and this may still happen, I'm sure it will, um, there's a musical being made of A Face in the Crowd uh, with the music by Elvis Costello. So, uh, oh. <laughs> that, yeah, I actually, the last time I saw Elvis Costello live, he actually performed a couple of songs from his score yeah. for what will be a Broadway musical or they hope will be a Broadway musical. But um, that obviously because of COVID, they haven't gotten that together yet. And who, who knows if they will, but yeah. he did, he did write it. I mean, the, the, the music is written for it. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Steve's other question was about actors who appeared in noir that you see in other roles. I guess he means on TV. Like, you know, My Three Sons for Fred McMurray and Perry Mason. And uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, Andy Griffith. <laughs> yeah, Andy Gri well, sure. that was a, that was a one timer for Andy Griffith playing that that venal a character. Yeah. Um, Lonesome Roads. But um, anybody that that you enjoy seeing in the old noir films that later would pop up on TV? Oh, that, yeah, Robert Young. <laughs> oh, that's one of the big ones. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Good choice. Uh, yes, Marcus. Who knew that Marcus Welby was a cad? You know, uh, at least I mean he wasn't in Crossfire, but he certainly was, and they won't believe me. Which oh god, He's which a is a completely awful person. <laughs> without being without being a criminal necessarily, he was just a cad. You know, he was just a two timing lying cad. Yeah, I think sleaze bag is the word I would use. A sleaze bag, but that was a pretty good year for Robert Young, right? Nineteen forty-seven. I mean, he did Crossfire, yeah. and they won't believe me. I think he did a he did another noir called The Second Woman. That uh, I don't think it was forty-seven. I think it came a little bit after that. Um, but that that's a great one, and of course, uh, th this is a good opportunity to plug our uh, <laughs> our restoration of the Argyle Secrets because yeah. that has. That has all these future TV stars in that one. Uh, you know, Marjorie Lord, who would, who is the femme fatale in it, would go on to be a, a TV star. You know, she was on the Danny Thomas show, yeah. uh, playing his wife for years. And then uh, Barbara Billingsley has a has a part, a pretty good, small but vivid role in the film, Mrs. Cleaver. 
And then Sergeant Schultz, John Banner, has a, a pretty rich role in yeah. the Argyle Secrets. Uh, you youngsters out there may not remember him from Hogan's Heroes, you know. I do. <laughs> from the repeats. Well, I, well, I should, I should yeah. never say that because I... I forget because I saw all these shows when they were first on television yeah. and I forget that they're syndicated and that they've rerun forever. And so, you know, people know this even who weren't alive back then. Oh, and um, there's another one of our restorations too that has someone that was famous for playing someone good on TV. It's um, a woman this time. Why, why you're stumping me, Anne? I'm trying to think. Like, who who did we restore a film of? It's set in San Francisco. Uh, uh that would be Woman on the Run, perhaps. No, the other one's no? set in San Francisco. Restored. What's what's the other one set in San Francisco? <laughs> Boy, I am I am not firing on all cylinders this holiday season. What's the film? <laughs> I, I I I I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, the man who, is it the man who hanged oh, himself? Oh, yes, yes, of course. The man who cheated himself. Cheated I'm himself. Sorry, the man who hanged himself is Boris Karloff. Yeah, that's right. The man who cheated himself. <laughs> yes, yes. With Jane Wyatt, of course, uh, yeah. from Father Knows Best. She is a with, naughty With niece. Robert Young. That's why you, that's, <laughs> that's why you had that connection all along. Yeah, of course. I, I was thinking of Marcus Welby and totally forgetting about father knows best, but yeah, and actually it's funny uh, because and uh, meet me in St. Louis. My ex husband always said, you know, that it was terrible that you know these two murderers wound up having this big family in St. Louis because <laughs> it was you know Leon Ames and Mary Astor played the yeah. parents in that one. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm I'm just embarrassed that I couldn't remember that we'd restored two movies that were set in San Francisco. <laughs> I want to I want to credit that to our just getting so much accomplished that I've lost track of how many films we've restored. I don't know if that's true or not, but I was just drawing a blank. And no, I'm not hung over from New Year's Eve. No, that's not it. That's, that's not it at all. Okay. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, you go. Number six. Migo. This is uh, from Clifton, Virginia. This is Margaret asking. Well, saying she would love to hear what you can tell us about the male character in Crossfire. Oh, I thought for a second it was going to be Robert Young, uh, whose scenes all take place in Ginny's apartment. His dialogue was amusingly bizarre. Yes. Uh, and you are right, Margaret. The actor was Paul Kelly. And have I, I think we've talked about Paul yeah. Kelly previously. And, um, uh, but a very interesting story in that uh, Paul Kelly uh, is he's the answer to a, a great trivia question. If you wanted to say, like, what actors have, have killed somebody and served time in prison for it who have gone on to have successful careers, successful movie careers? Uh, Paul Kelly would be at the top of my list because yeah. he he was a, a Broadway actor and he. Uh, the story is he was having an affair with his co-star. Um, oh, come on in. You can do it. Um, Dorothy McKyle. Wow. And, um, and they had an affair. And then he uh, confronted her husband in yeah. their home. And they got, they were drunk and they uh, got into a fight and Paul Kelly killed him. And a interestingly, both he and Dorothy McHale went to prison because she was deemed an accomplice because she did not, it was determined that she did not call the police soon enough. She, after her husband was beat up, she put him to bed and yeah. didn't call the police. And so if she had called the police, he might have survived. But she did not. So she was also uh, found guilty of manslaughter, not murder, but they determined it to be manslaughter. But they both served time. Yeah. And she wrote a play about it um, that was turned into, I think it was made into films a couple of times. I know that Stanwyck was in it. Um, what is it called? Ladies They ladies they Talk About or la um, something. Oh, Ladies They Talk About? Really? I think oh. that's that's the play. 
that Dorothy McHale wrote when she was in, in the joint. Wow. And then um, Paul Kelly got out. And the capper to the story, of course, is that then they married. Yeah. And um, Paul Kelly's uh, or, or Dorothy McHale's daughter was extremely fond of Paul Kelly. Yeah. And accepted him as her stepfather, even though she was a witness to him beating her biological father to death. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty freaking noir, if you ask. Me. Yeah, no, it really is, but also kind of makes you wonder what type of man it, her father was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, perhaps, I mean? perhaps uh, because... worse. You know, I mean, because they were extremely close, and then and then Dorothy McHale died in a car accident. Uh, not not long after she was released from, from prison and, uh, and Paul Kelly raised the daughter as, as his own. So pretty, pretty interesting story. Uh, I know more about that than I know about the background of, of what the hell is going on with his character in Crossfire. I mean, (laughs) I just, it's just very bizarre. I just assumed that he was like, Jenny's pimp kind of yeah and that they were sort of they'd been together a long time and he was he was far too old for her Mm -hmm. and they were just playing out some weird relationship that they had yeah and uh it it was just wonderful it's it's one it's it is actually my favorite thing in the movie I mean Crossfire is pretty great but but Paul Kelly is my favorite thing in the movie well, that scene is amazing. His performance it is is amazing because he's so unsettling. Because you just you you don't know his train like you can't figure out how he's thinking, and so you don't yeah. know what he's going to do. So he's kind of threatening, you know, because he feels really unpredictable. Yeah, it's it's like you're watching a kind of a normal uh, manhunt film. And then yeah. all of a sudden there's this David Lynch movie that suddenly happens yeah. in the middle of the yeah. thing. Yeah. Because yeah. It, just his dialogue is so eerie because he, he does that whole heartfelt monologue about their life together. And then he goes, none of that's true. I, I just made all that up. Yeah. None it is a real lynching <laughs> character, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Yeah. And it is, like I said, it's just because it's such a tonal shift in the film too. Yeah, exactly. But then and I love the fact like this, that, yeah. No, no go ahead. It's like, no, I just think it is like the main characters in this nightmare. So in a way that does make sense that it kind of adds to that feeling of, of this almost being unreal to him because of course he's under so much stress and stuff like all of a sudden everything in his life is falling apart. Exactly. And I, and as in all movies that take place overnight, yeah, you, you get the, the whole thing is you're encountering people who are awake in the dead of night. Yeah. And whose lives are really, really strange and unusual. And you find, you know, it's like Deadline at Dawn and 99 River Street. And I I think of Scorsese's After Hours, where Paul Kelly could have walked in on that movie right in the middle and fit right in. You know, let me tell you the story of my life. It's three o'clock in the morning and I'm going to tell you this story. And then you listen to it and you go, wow, that's crushing. He goes, yeah, I just made it all up. <laughs> no, I was just thinking, and also it made me think of Midnight Diner again with that show. But it's the same thing because he's his place is open from midnight to seven. So it's like this really interesting cross-section of people who would never meet each other except for the fact that, you know, they want to right. stop off somewhere because they don't have any, anyone to go home to. Right, right. I have yeah. to say it was interesting. I've noticed that we got a lot of thank yous for <laughs> turning know. people on to Midnight Diner. That was kind of funny. It's not not noir, really, but uh, it, it is like a great. Um, it, it's uh, whenever I don't know what else to watch, I, I watch a Midnight Diner. Because it's yeah. like it's 30 minutes long. It's like 11 o'clock at night or something. And it's like, I'm not quite ready to turn in yet. But eh, let's watch a midnight diner. You know? Yeah, I showed him to my mom while I was in Sugarland, Texas. She loved it. And, oh, good. Yeah. And so I had to reassure her because we didn't, that Marilyn does eventually find a good man. <laughs> to fall <laughs> She's very concerned about Marilyn's love life. <laughs> and it's not her biggest fan. Our, uh, yeah, I can yeah. never remember that guy's name. Anyway, we shouldn't we yeah, shouldn't go, go down this right rabbit hole. Yes. Yeah, these will be okay. here for hours. Yeah. Okay. Um. This is wait. 
Yeah, this is me. Uh, this is Christy Grants uh, from or Pass, Oregon. No, she's Christy from Grants Pass, Oregon. For, oh, Christy from <laughs> Grants Pass, Oregon. Thank you. <laughs> um, we all love the dialogue in noir, but Anne's recent example of Kim and Jimmy sharing a cigarette in the parking garage in Better Call Saul reminded me of how powerful nonverbal acting can be. What are some of your favorite or most memorable nonverbal moments in noir? For me, Jean Tierney's performance as Ellen in Leave Her to Heaven stands out. Hmm. Interesting. Um, nonverbal moments in yeah. noir. I have one. Okay, let's hear it. Joan Crawford uh, in... Um, Oh my God, I've forgotten the name of the film. The one set in San Francisco. Sudden Fear. Lance. Sudden Fear. Sudden Fear, yes. Yeah, because they set it up that she's a writer. So when she's in her office, she has a dictaphone that turns on automatically so that she can just start, you know, capturing her thoughts about whatever she's writing. And so her husband and his mistress don't know that. So they go into her, her library or study where she works and they have a conversation about killing her. And so later on, Joan's character, you know, comes into that room and the dictaphone starts and she overhears this plot. And it's really great because it's not that short of a scene. I mean, because it's a fairly long dialogue between the two characters. And it's all it is, is her reacting with her face to her finding out that the man she loves, her husband, is cheating on her and wants to murder her, you know. Um, and that's just like her performance. And that's amazing. Yeah. So it's a fabulous reaction shot. I, yeah. I love that movie because it's um, I love the poster for that movie because it's just Joan Crawford's eyes. Uh -huh. That's the whole poster. And it's like yeah. they they knew that her performance was a beautifully reactive performance in the film and they used it to sell the movie. You know, yeah. it's her reacting, you know, yeah. Very good. I, I guess I'll take this moment to throw out an obscurity uh, that people can look for uh, called The Thief with Ray Milland uh, that was written by Russell Rouse and Clarence Green and directed by Russell Rouse that has no dialogue. Mm -hmm. The movie has no dialogue at all. There, yeah. There's a soundtrack and a, and a score, but there is no dialogue. Yeah. Ray Milland plays a, a communist spy in washington dc uh and i think i think it, by the end it gets up to to new york i think there's a, some scenes in new york and um anyway it's just it's just really amazing because there's no dialogue uh and I, I as far as i know that's the only noir film from that classic era that is like that um uh other non-verbal scenes. Um, I do like the scene. It, it dialogue plays into it by as it as it works itself out. But I love the scene in Crisscross where Burt Lancaster's in the hospital and he's suspicious that uh, the guy down the hall is not a visitor to the hospital, but is actually there to kill him. And I think that there's you know there's some inconsequential faux dialogue in that scene until it gets real but that that's very suspenseful and i've always liked liked that scene very much yeah and i think barbara stanwell can double indemnity when she's um in the back seat of the car or, or she's in the car driving and fred mcmurray is like killing her husband yes her, her eyes get all big and it's a very sexual look on her face totally totally yeah, yeah. She's feral. She gets very excited when she uh, she knows the deed is happening. It's yeah, uh, yeah. that's pretty great. And I guess there's also the nonverbal scene is that now that you mentioned that, I think of the opening of the letter, you know, the killing that starts uh, the letter where Betty Davis comes out on the porch of, of uh, and and shoots her lover yeah. and kills him. That that is that's one of the best openings of a film ever noir yeah. or otherwise it's just fantastic anyway. yeah because it starts out with the shots of the plantation so you so you're getting it really literally sets the scene and then just her coming out there with the gun and her evening gown as you like to wear when you shoot people fabulous <laughs> fabulous and and uh, you can literally say that the that 
William Wyler has that scene dripping with atmosphere because mm-hmm. it is literally, literally dripping, dripping with atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I can't remember who photographed that. It was either Saul Polito or Sid Hickox or somebody who photographed the letter. And it was it was absolutely fantastic. OK, that that's a few. There are obviously others. And I'm sure our, our the smart fans will be weighing in yeah. uh, with their own examples. Uh, okay, this is me now. Uh, Mark Guildford from the UK. Hey, Mark, how are you? Uh, he has a, a TCM imprint book, Into the Dark, which for each film featured, that's Mark Vieira's book, contains an excerpt of a letter written to the studio by a regional theater owner. Sometimes these letters praise the film in question, but often they complain about its unsuitability for their regular crowd. And this got me wondering, did contemporary film noir audiences have a clear demographic in terms of age, location, income, and so forth? Um, Well, uh, absolutely not. Um, Although most of the complaints, I mean, this, this is based on my own research that I did for Dark City back in the, you know, (laughs) the end of the last century. Um, which you you find by researching uh, motion picture herald magazines and uh, showman's review or uh, th- you know trade publications for the movie business and most of the complaints came from theater owners in the sticks as variety uh-huh. would would say and they said you know these movies are alarming uh, to our audiences, they were they were not alarming to urban audiences. Yeah. So if the demographic, if there was a demographic for these films, it it was cities. Mm-hmm. I mean, film film noir played a lot better in cities than it did in the hinterlands, so yeah. to speak. Um, but you know, and and Mark raises an interesting uh, question here because. I don't think there was a, I think there was a balanced demographic for these films when they were created. Like, uh, and I've, I've made this observation a bunch of times that crime thrillers, which is what they were called in these showman's manuals, right? Mm -hmm. They would say, here's what's coming up. So you'd get an issue of these magazines if, if you owned a theater and it would tell you, here's what you can expect in the spring season Uh from Paramount and from Fox and, you know, all this stuff. And it would talk about the upcoming films and it would uh, label them by genre. Right. And none of them were called film noir. They were called crime thrillers or murder dramas. Yeah. And crime thrillers were generally films aimed at men. Uh Uh, and they were generally about professional criminals and murder dramas could often be aimed at women. Yeah. And, you know, obviously that's a no brainer. They starred Barbara Stanwyck and Joan Crawford yeah. and Ida Lupino and Anne yeah. Sheridan. And, you know, whereas a crime thriller would be like kiss of death or the asphalt jungle or, you know, something where they're, they're professional criminals. Involved. Yeah. Um, so I I do think the studios sold them to both men and women. Yeah. But film writers and film scholars tended to be male. And so as the decades passed and now it got called film noir, yeah. I think they started to make the genre extremely masculine. Uh-huh. Be- because it became a very popular notion that, oh, these films were made when they were made because men felt emasculated by women in the workforce on the home front after. And it's like, mm, not really true. Yeah. I mean, look at look at in our conversation just now. I mean, we've cited as many movies starring women, right? Sudden Fear and uh, Sorry, Wrong Number. And, you know, all all these movies, Mildred Pierce. Yeah, are are totally noir films uh, that were marketed to women. You know, the postman always rings twice. Famously, was marketed to women. They they yeah. sold it as a as a romance. You know, their yeah. love was a flame that burned. You know, 
they yeah. didn't sell it as a as a crime story for guys. It was yeah. a romance for women. Yeah. So I, I don't think that there was any demographic, except obviously, as you know, Mark, movies made in the 30s and 40s uh, were made for adults. Yeah. And and not the kids were not considered a demographic until yeah. the until the 1950s. Yeah. And and then everything changed, right? And then you got juvenile delinquent movies and science fiction movies and more horror movies and all this that were aimed at a much younger demographic. That's what I got for you, Mark. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, I have recently developed a fascination with B movies of the film noir world. For whatever reason, I find tawdry plots and ridiculous dialogue irresistible and often hilarious. <laughs> I know. I also preach the truly artistic achievements of talents like Val Luton and Edgar Ulmer who made great films on a budget. I am eager to learn more about the B world and wonder if you have any recommendations for books or other resources on the Poverty Row studios and the people behind them. Side note, thank you for a great North City DC. The Argyle Secrets on the big screen was a real treat. Anna. Okay. Fantastic. I appreciate that, Anna. Um Okay, I'm going to start. You'll appreciate this, Anne. I'm going to start this answer by noting that you should get back issues of the Noir City magazine because uh, several years ago, Jake Hinkson wrote a whole series uh, on Poverty Row filmmakers, mm -hmm. uh, hey. looking looking at, at uh, primarily directors who specialized in B films. And... Uh, you could probably find some of these online. I think Jake also posted a few of these uh, on his own blog or something, but, but there are, they are in back issues. And it was, um, I, I forget what we called the series. It was poverty row something. And, and he looked at a lot of uh, great filmmakers um, in that series. Uh, the most entertaining book on this subject is um, death on the cheap. By Art Lyons. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, which is specifically about exactly the movies, uh, you know, that Anna is talking about. Um, and, and I think that can, I don't know if it's still in print, but it's it's not hard to find. Death yeah. on the Cheap by Arthur Lyons. And Art, and Art is the guy who started the Film Noir Festival in Palm Springs that our colleague Alan Rohde now runs. Art passed <laughs> away a few years ago. Um, and I would recommend there's a, there's a, old book by uh, Todd McCarthy uh, called Kings of the Bees. I'm looking over at my shelf right now. Yep, there it is. Kings yeah. of the Bees, uh, which is a great reference to filmmakers who specialize in B movies. Now, that's all B movies, like jungle movies and Westerns and everything, not just noir stuff. So um, it's pretty all encompassing. And just for the hell of it, I mean, if you if you haven't read peter bogdanovich's uh books of interviews um who the devil made it yeah there are two volumes of those and the great thing about the late great peter bogdanovich is that he uh he interviewed everybody mm -hmm. you know so he, he has interviews with a-list masters and uh interviews with you know all these people you know edgar ulmer and joe lewis and don siegel and guys who really came up through the B trenches like Phil Carlson and everything. So yeah, and th and those are very, very, very good interviews that he has with them. Yeah. And if you just want to learn about the whole process of, of low budget filmmaking too, um, Roger Corman's autobiography is really fascinating. Um, it, it, you know, how I made a hundred movies and only less money on one, I think is the name of it, but it goes just through the, the whole whole thing and then William Castle's autobiography is also really interesting and is another kind of look into uh how you produce films <laughs> you know on mm -hmm. a low budget and be successful so you know and there's just they both just have great stories about people they worked with too absolutely no those are two two great suggestions and it's just interesting because you know Corman um and William Castle William Castle sort of began in the studio system Mm -hmm. but uh, soon became independent and did his own thing in the fifties and sixties uh, and into the seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, but Corman, come on, 
Cor- yeah. Corman, Corman has to be one of the 10 most significant people in American film history. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, just for his, his output is interesting in and of itself, but all of the people who came through his shop, mm-hmm. it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing him a few years ago on the Turner Classic Movies cruise. Yeah. And seriously, the entire cruise could have been just us talking. Yeah. Because there was so much to cover. It was, yeah. it, and he would tell these stories that were just like amazing that would lead to another story about somebody else that he gave his start to. And, and you just forget. I mean, I, I, I was totally unprepared as an interviewer because he would keep coming up with stuff that's like, ah, I f- entirely forgot about that, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, so yes, good good call on Corman. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, one of the fun things about Scream 3 is he plays a, a Hollywood studio head in that. Ah. I mean, it's, just, it's literally one scene, but it's great. Just to say, because just seeing him play someone that was his antithesis was really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's he's had a lot of uh, filmmakers try to pay him back with cameos yeah. and things, you know, yeah. he's in, he's in Godfather too. You know, he's one of the, the payback guys in Godfather too. Coppola really? casts him. Yeah. 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 Corman's yeah, in yeah. that film. Oh my God. Uh, as is William Bowers, who plays one of the guys on the congressional committee, you know, investigating organized crime, the great screenwriter, Bill Bowers, who taught oh. Coppola how to write screenplays. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. You know, is it, and there are a bunch of other people too that he, I think Coppola kind of stacked the committee with people that he was paying tribute to. Anyway, um, let me see where we are here. Uh, um, oh, this okay. is, uh, it's me, right? Yes, you have 10. Okay. Um, Mary has heard about Please Murder Me. This is uh, back to our TV stuff. Uh, featuring two of my faves, Angela Lansbury and Raymond Burr. Could you please show it soon? <laughs> well, I wish I could, Mary, uh, but we would have to have, uh, and I'm not sure whether Mary is asking if we can show it theatrically or whether to show it on TCM. Yeah. Uh, either way, uh, it's going to take some work because the film is not in good condition. Oh. Uh, if you're curious about it and you don't care about such things, you can watch it on YouTube, I think. Um, but it, it's not a bad film. Um, I believe Peter Godfrey directed it, who had made, you know, some good Hollywood movies, who is really close friends with Barbara Stanwyck. And uh, he made the terrible two Mrs. Carols, but we won't hold that against yeah. him. Mm-hmm. And... Um, but it's a. I always thought of that film as a trial run for Perry Mason. That was Raymond Burr's ah. uh, screen test for Perry Mason, because you know I think it's 1950. I think it's probably 1956 that film was made. I forget when Perry Mason started on television. It was not long after that. And uh, yeah, Angela Lansbury plays the femme fatale, and she she gets Raymond Burr to defend her on a murder charge, very very much like the plot is very similar to the file on Thelma Jordan. Yeah. And anyway, I, I won't give away the, the plot, but, uh, but Burr lost a lot of weight to, to oh. play this role, to, to play like the quote unquote romantic lead in the film. And uh, and then as soon as he lost that weight, people started seeing him differently. And then the next thing you know, he's Perry Mason on TV. And and basically he, he's playing the same character, except he's except Perry Mason was not as gullible as the character he plays. <laughs> Please murder me. Um, so uh, but the, the, the problem there is I Mary, I want you to know, we, I do have my eye on the film. There, there are elements uh, that exist in an archive, and it just remains to be seen if that's going to be on our uh, immediate to-do list. We were kind of it, it, 
rose on the list because I wanted to restore it while Angela Lansbury was still alive. Yeah. And and now obviously I'm kind of depressed because we didn't accomplish that and uh, yeah. she's she is gone now. Um but it it's a it's a worthy film and it has historical significance for the very reasons I just said. It it feels like the precursor to to the Perry Mason TV show. Yeah, and just a quick side note. Uh Angela Lansbury and Steven Sondheim both have a tiny cameo in The Glass Onion, the new Knives Out film. Um, and the I've, film's dedicated to them. So, yeah. I, I didn't get to the dedication. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. That, the movie did not do it for me. Oh, really? You just. No, not, not at you? all. I know. I, de- I enjoyed Knives Out. Yeah. I, I, I got a real kick out of that. And I. I, I I don't want to say too much negative stuff about it, yeah. you know, because I'm I'm I do like Ryan Johnson yeah. as a and but it just it just didn't work for some I could I I honestly I could only get like 20 minutes into it and I just huh. gave up. And I and I really like Daniel Craig, but yeah, quite honestly, I don't know what the hell he's doing in that. I don't know what that character <laughs> is, I don't know what that that voice is. It just it's like, uh, I'd rather watch his Belvedere vodka ad like 10 times than, than, than watch that. Uh, anyway, that's I'll make up for it with a recommendation for something good before we're done. But, OK, yeah. No, I mean, I, I liked it because it was just such an homage to the old Agatha Christie movies, um, the big budget all star So I really think that that's why I liked it. it was yeah, I no, I, I no, I totally understand it. Um, and so do I, and I didn't feel it compared well mm. to them. You know, I understood exactly what he was doing. He was yeah. doing a modern version of it yeah. and kind of ripping on the shallowness of the of the tech culture and the social yeah. media stuff and all that. And I hate I hate that all so much to begin with that I don't really <laughs> want to see a parody of it or a, or a satire on it. It's just yeah. like, oh God, yeah. uh, please make it stop. Yeah. Anyway, sorry about that, but <laughs> it's okay. uh, that's, that's the way I feel. Okay, um, who who's up next here? Uh, me, and this is from Spencer. What do you consider the first true nor film? I thought Stranger on the Third Floor or Rebecca or They Drive by Night. <laughs> What film? film. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> I know this is like the question I've been asked, you know, but you get past Let's what is film again. noir? What is film noir? And then it's so what was the first film noir? Yeah. Uh, you know, here's the way I answer this. Because as as should be clear by now. I look at film noir as an artistic movement yeah. and therefore I see this, the starting point as the trigger for that movement. Yeah. You can always find one-offs that are precursors or proto noirs or whatever yeah. you want to call it. You know, they're, they're all the way back in the silent era. There's plenty in the pre-code era. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's even a few in the thirties that, that sneak in, you know, let them live and other stuff. But for all intents and purposes, it's the Maltese Falcon. Yeah. It's the 1941 version. I'm sorry. It's not a more obscure answer, but the reality is it was the popularity of that film Mm -hmm. and, and Bogart's creation of that Mm antihero. Right. Because he's a detective who does not uphold the law. Yeah. He's a detective who operates for his own purposes and is trying to get ahead on his own. He is, he has situational ethics. Mm-hmm. This was very, very important to the development of film noir. Mm-hmm. And the fact that that movie was so successful and basically not only created, um, and the Maltese Falcon didn't just create uh, uh, start the engine, ignite the engine for making more films like that. Um, but, you know, Bogart created a, a kind of world weary character that essentially became the template for almost every male character in, in noir. 
Now I understand Stranger on the Third Floor had the look and everything. Yeah. But but was it an influential film? Yeah. Hell no. Yeah. Hell no. I mean, that was a film that was discovered much later saying, look at this, look at what they were doing in this film visually, you know? Yeah. But I don't, I, I mean, you could say that it had an impact, but I don't think Stranger on the Third Floor had the same impact as say Murder My Sweet or Phantom Lady or The Woman in the Window or Double Indemnity. Any of those movies that came just before the end of the war. Yeah. Those were all hugely popular and caught everybody's attention. Stranger on the Third Floor kind of slipped in under the radar, you know. And I don't actually consider Rebecca to be uh it's always been more of a gothic thing. Do people to think me. Rebecca's film noir? Because uh, I don't find it film noir at all. I mean, to me, it's like you said, it's it's a gothic, it's, it's a really a, yeah. gothic story. I mean, it's very true. God, I hate that movie. You hate Rebecca? Yeah, couldn't stand that. I, I, it's nothing to, I mean, the film's actually really good and the book's actually really good. It's just yeah. that I just want to slap the crap out of Rebecca, not Rebecca, the the Mrs. DeWinter, the writer of the story, the unnamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. she's just such a. Yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I restrain myself from saying the word I wanted to use. Well, well it's I I, I, I paint myself into a corner sometimes because I'm such an advocate for for saying, you know, they're female centric noir as well. Yeah. But yet I don't really consider Rebecca to be a, a prime example of it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? To me so, it's much more I mean, that's such a traditional story. Of it just it, of, it's really a gothic story. Yeah. It really yeah. is. I mean, it's that's just what it's pulling from. And also, I think that this should be credit for Mary Astor for really doing how much her character really set the template for femme fatales. Um, Absolutely. I mean, she's incredible in that film. Uh, so I just I just wanted to pitch Mary in there. <laughs> Good. No, I appreciate that because I don't I don't think she gets enough credit. No. I mean, it's a it's a it's an all I would say it's practically a perfectly cast film. Yeah. And even though she was not John Huston's first choice for the role, Geraldine yeah. Fitzgerald was, um, she's great in it. And I commend uh, Houston for casting her because I'm trying to think of what would be the corollary today. Uh, I mean, who who's a performer today that, that has uh, suffered a great scandal and then had a comeback? Because uh, that, that's what she did. You know, she yeah. she was a dominant actress in the 1930s. Yeah. And and then she had her, you know, her diary released, you know, and yeah. read out in court and everything. Yeah. And and it was quite scandalous. Yeah. Uh it must have come as a shock to people to think that beautiful movie actresses had sex with a lot of people. Well, you what know a, what a shocker. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd like to point out for the people that annoyingly male people who always have to point out when I post about the Maltese Falcon, that, oh, Mary Astor wasn't sexy. One, that's Please. not a valid critique of her fucking performance, pardon me. And two, her diary says otherwise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ask George S. Kaufman what he thinks about Mary Astor's sexiness. Yeah. Um, but she's great in the film because what she has to be is a compulsive liar and yeah. and and she's brilliant at it yeah i mean she is just fantastic in how many different ways she lies in the film and yeah. right to bogart's face you know yeah. it was just which is why i love madeline khan's character so much in the cheap detective <laughs> she just kills me in that it's a pretty entertaining movie it is and she's just so great in it um yeah, and also, I mean, I really like Geraldine Fitzgerald, but I just can't see anyone besides Mary Astor because, I don't know, Mary Astor was just, like, able to hit all these different tones. It'd be kind of neurotic, too, but that's also sort well, of when, not really who she is. She isn't really neurotic. You know what I mean? It's just, like, I, I just can't picture anyone else doing that role besides her. I think she was perfect for it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, but, of course, if you watch Three Strangers... Uh -huh. You see Geraldine Fitzgerald basically playing Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. I mean, she That's she true. has a lot of the same energy and a lot of the same, yeah. like, 
crazy. Uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy, the way Mary Astor played her, was a little more uh, subtle in her calculating, right? Yeah. The, the Crystal, what's her name? Crystal Shackelford, the character uh, Fitzgerald plays in Three Strangers, is it seems like she's got something on the ball, and then yeah. she just progressively becomes more, cra- more crazy as yeah. the movie goes on. But she's got big big energy big yeah. sexy crazy energy in that movie it's great yeah. <clears throat> is that a thing big say big sexy crazy energy big like sexy it. crazy energy it's a it's a good thing to have in a movie mm-hmm. it's, it's important yeah okay so okay here is a uh, lauren from chicago lauren always comes in with with something interesting okay. yeah and this, is a, this is a pretty long uh, thing I may I may paraphrase. Uh, Lauren says it. He finds a strong distinction between noir films made in the '40s compared to those from the 1950s. Films in the '50s seem more realistic and often shot on location. The male actors are frequently unshaven, wear cheap clothes, and never have any money. Welcome to noir. The female characters are more vulnerable and far less glamorous compared to the women in films from the prior decade. Well, you can blame some of the hairstylists for that because the hairstyles in the 50s were not good compared to the 40s. Oh, yeah, no. In 40s films, everybody is cleanly scrubbed and well-dressed. Even when a character is going through a dramatic situation, the worst thing that can happen to them is that their hair is out of place. And then he references uh, your favorite, Repeat Performance, uh, where Louis Hayward ends up... uh, you know, in a wheelchair, but yeah. he's still in a suit with cufflinks and the whole thing. <laughs> and, and he has that goofy little bandage it's over his head. Yeah. That, which is a common yeah. thing. That must have been a thing back then, you know, the, the cold compress. Because, yeah. you know, it's the same one. He borrowed it from Dana Andrews and where the sidewalk <laughs> ends because he has the same one on his head, you know. And it's like, do these guys have any idea how stupid they look wearing these cold compresses? Oh. But I mean, they would have actually shaved their head if they actually needed to bandage it. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, for these reasons alone, Lauren says he prefers noirs from the 1950s. Uh, oh, and here's an interesting note at the end. He says, I assume the ending of the production code contributed to this more realistic noir look in the 1950s. Um, I, uh, I don't agree with that uh, because... I, I don't think the production code had anything to do with it. I think it it really had to do with the fact that, as as Lauren points out early on here, uh, the movies weren't being made in the studio yeah. as often. So once they were out of the studio, uh, studio executives aren't seeing everything that's being done. Yeah. So you obviously... I mean, famously, I remember uh, Evelyn Keyes telling me how when they shot the killer that stalked New York on location in New York, and then they would send the rushes back to Columbia, Harry Cohn would go berserk because she looked so bad Yeah, in the rushes. And she'd say, well, you idiot, I'm dying of smallpox. You know, that's why I look <laughs> bad. You know, I'm not going to look glamorous. But I mean, that cuts to the heart of what Lauren is talking about here, you know. If if the movie was shot on sets in Hollywood, they Harry Cohn probably would have sent somebody down to make sure that she looked good, mm-hmm. right? And I know exactly what Lauren is talking about, but I think the change had a lot to do with um, social style, mm-hmm. that the style of the 1950s in general changed. Uh-huh. And that women's the the look changed for women, the the glamour look of the forties, the luxurious look, the uh-huh. the stoles and the you know the Veronica Lake hair and uh-huh. the Ava Gardner hair and the Rita Hayworth hair all kind of gave way to you know the Marilyn hair uh-huh. and and the shorter hair and tighter curls and all this stuff uh-huh. uh, that had a with the way the women look and and as for the guys yeah i think it was just a general uh toughening up that probably had uh, a corollary in the change in acting style Uh i think that a lot of the actors who 
we're now trying to give more natural performances. Uh-huh. You could, uh, I would say that Marlon Brando had more to do with this than the production code, because I just think that part and parcel of the performances, if they're now going to let you mumble your lines instead of enunciate your lines, they're also going to let you have a little stubble. You're going to get away with stuff visually. Yeah. And I'm not, that's not a criticism of, of no, Brando just, when I say I just, that, you know. There's a Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon where uh, Bullwinkle's an actor and he's totally doing Marlon Brando. He's oh, it's like the t-shirt and he's mumbling. And I'm sorry, just when you started saying that, I started picturing Bullwinkle. Well, but there, you perfect. See, uh, 1951, Streetcar Named Desire. Yeah. I mean, look at Brando in that film. I mean, yeah. nobody nobody looked like that in a yeah. movie in Hollywood before yeah. before that. You uh-huh. know? That had a huge impact. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of male actors were like, they still do this to this day. You know, let me let, really mess me up. I just want to yeah. be as yeah. disheveled and wrecked as possible. You know, um, and what's interesting is that. In some cases, when you see that, it becomes as much of an affect as anything else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's not always... You, you watch actors who aren't Marlon Brando and who aren't Montgomery Clift. I mean, sometimes I see it in James Dean's performances where it's like, he is really acting. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is acting, yeah. you know? Yeah. He's not, and, uh, you know, if you're if you're not super compelling at it, yeah, James Dean was. I'm, yeah. I'm not criticizing him, but uh, you know, other method actors can sometimes just grate on you. Like yeah. you could see, you could see why you know uh, a director would say, "Can you just stand and say the line? Just, yeah. just say the line, please." <laughs> yeah, and I think too that um, I mean, I have much more of an appreciation of subtle actors like. I'm going to bring up Moss Mickelson, sorry, but he really uses, like his face can be very stoic and it's just really his eyes that are conveying a lot. And he's a very like, he can be a very subtle actor. And I really like that type of acting. Or like I mentioned this before, but like Judith Light in the menu is amazing because everybody's given a pretty over the top performance and she seems like someone that was really like you would see at a fancy restaurant that was somebody with money, but not necessarily sophisticated. You know what I mean? Her performance is so grounding. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I think she deserves a best actress nomination, which she will never get for that part because that's that kind of acting is not appreciated. Well, this is a, this is a subject for another yeah, installment yeah, and, yeah. and maybe, maybe someone will send it in because, um, I have always thought that, you know, when the awards start being announced, it's all such a colossal fraud to begin with. Yeah. And I just don't think there is such a thing as a best, best. Yeah. Well, it is called now best performance by an actor in a leading role, best performance yeah. by instead of best actor, or best actress. I mean, they you in the old days, they used to give a best actor award because it was like this person gave more great performances this year than anybody else. Yeah. You and they could be nominated for multiple films, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, this year, Colin Farrell would win in a, in a walk, you know, because the guy has had such an amazing year with all these. Did you see the Banshees of Inna Sharon? I haven't seen it yet. No. <laughs> fantastic. Just fantastic. Um, anyway. Yeah. And not, I would, yeah. And I but, just, but I also, say, yeah. If I was giving acting awards, I would give most valuable actor. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't give best per- because the the reality is it's always someone who does a beautiful job playing a very, very well-written character. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, and then they say it's the best, best performance. And it's like, it's actually kind of the best character. It's like the best written yeah. character, well-performed. Yeah. But I want to get I want to give awards to actors who carry movies that otherwise stink. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, why did I watch this entire movie? It's because the actor was so good. 
Oh yeah. You I know? mean, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing were just amazing to me because those movies they did together are so great and they have no business being that great. But a lot of it was just because they had great chemistry, but also they, they just took it seriously and just, yeah. you know, and just did their job. And, you know, I think that Peter, uh, you know, Vincent Price is another one where I just think he's the same way. They were just true professionals. So they weren't, you know, vain about it. They were being hired and they were going to do a really good job and really sell these things. They were just, you know, inherently kind of unbelievable. So. Yeah. And I think that if the Academy Awards want to stay relevant, they need to, uh, they need to come up with a few new categories that I think people would love to see. And I know there, there've been efforts to do this over the years. Uh, like they need to give an award for casting. Like this is the best job of casting in a film. Uh, you know, you can retroactively award that to like the Maltese Falcon or the asphalt jungle or something yeah. like that. Uh, they also, they finally just need to suck it up and give an award for stunt work. Because how, how is how has there not been an Academy Award for stunts? Yeah. If they get if they're giving awards for computer effects yeah. in a movie, they got to start giving awards for practical stunt work. You know, yeah. and it's uh, but it's almost insulting that they haven't done it because yeah. the first person who wins it, everybody's just going to say it's nothing compared to Ben Hur. Or, or you know, any yeah. anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of remarkable that they don't give that award. Yeah, but you know, the Academy's were too because, like, you know, I would definitely say if we're doing Best Actress this year, I mean, Mia Goth. I mean, Pearl is amazing, but then because it's got, two, right? Well, and X, and then you got to see Pearl. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I haven't seen is. Pearl yet, but so uh, she she would definitely be the one. Like, if you could nominate, like, like they did with Janet Gaynor for. Uh, I think it was Seventh Heaven and right. um, uh, Street Angels. Street Angel, yeah, I, you know because those three performances she gives are remarkable. You're but right; they, it is three performances. I three forgot that for a second because yeah. she. Yeah. I didn't even know that it was her playing two either. roles in X. I didn't. I had no idea. I, I had to read that because I had yeah. no idea either. She's a remarkable actress, and I'm looking forward to Maxine with three X's. Yeah, she's carving out a really uh, cool niche for herself in the business yeah. and and writing her own yeah, characters, she, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, she co-wrote Pearl, and it's, it's it, yeah, you, I, I can't wait for you to see it so you can talk about it, because I'm just dying for you to see that film. Yeah, I mean, you, we, yeah, we shared our thoughts about X, you know, yeah. which which was certainly watchable, but I, I we need not go down that yeah. path again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I hope some folks from the Academy are watching so that they can take take this all to take heart. Take our, our notes about the Academy Awards. I'm well. sure they care about my opinion. Yeah. Okay, okay. so this is our, from our friend Alan from San Anselmo, oh, San Anselmo. California. Alan yeah. Rossi from, yes. from uh, San Anselmo. Uh, where did Eddie and Ann first meet? Was there any athletic sport you two played in high school? I like to watch a movie in a theater without without eating drinking how about you too is popcorn a must have soft drinks etc <laughs> alan goes right to the hardcore important yeah. questions i like that well number one we have we have mentioned previously where we met would you like to fill the latecomers in on that end yes it was this at the seattle international film festival um and you were presenting like it was like a two two film noirs um, what a surprise yeah, and I'm trying to remember. It was it. Oh God, I can't remember. Was it the? Was it the I, secret? Was it secret cinema? No, no, no. You were you were presenting actual. Um, it was. Um, was it the window? Yeah, it was a double feature. It was the window and maybe deadline at dawn. Yeah, I can't. Remember. I, I think maybe. Yeah. I also did a thing there. They used to do a thing called Secret Cinema. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I did that one time, which was they, which was a great idea. They would show a movie, but they couldn't announce what the movie was. Yeah. Because they didn't really have the rights to show it. There was yeah. some, there would always be some kind of reason why you can't show it. Yeah. And so they would never announce what the movie was. 
Yeah. And then they, my recollection is they, I could be wrong about this. They didn't charge admission. They asked for a suggested donation, Yeah. which, which helps because if you don't have the rights, then you're not actually charging to see the movie, but you're saying, but we suggest you donate to the, you know, a Seattle mm-hmm. International Film Festival or something. Mm-hmm. And those, needless to say, were always a sellout. Mm-hmm. And I, I presented the Brasher doubloon, ah. the, uh, like the missing uh, Philip Marlowe movie yeah. at at, uh, at the Egyptian uh, mm-hmm. during one of the SIF festivals. Um, anyway, so uh, finally that got cleared up, I guess, because I think it, it finally did come out on Blu-ray yeah, or DVD yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, pardon me. Any athletic sport that you played in high school? <laughs> you laugh. You laugh uproariously. <laughs> no, that's a. I'm taking that as a no. No, my God, I was going to the pub and smoking. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Good, good for you. you know, um, I would like to put a shout out. I had the best gym teacher, Mr. Randolph. Who, God, I loved him. He's the one who got me into weightlifting, which I still do. Um, and then also it was so funny though, because like when we'd go running, I was always like at the end, he'd always just run with me and talk with me. He's such a good guy. Uh, You're out there, Mr. Randolph, you were a great teacher. That's made me like Jim. That's nice. Oh God. Uh, no, I hate it. I hate, uh, I hate teenagers basically. And I hated being one. And so I would never, I would never play a team sport with teenagers. I just, no way. Uh, but after I got out of high school, I did play sports, uh, but not particularly well, although I was enthusiastic about it for a while. Uh, because I had some medical issues uh, in when I was in school that sort of left me um, for a couple of years where I didn't, I wasn't moving particularly well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we won't go into all the details, but when when those issues finally cleared up, then I really got into athletics. Yeah. Because it was just, a, I could finally move and I could yeah. do stuff. And, and it was like, oh my God, this is great. Because then there was no pressure to actually be good at it because you just feel yeah. like I just I just want to run around. I just want to <laughs> play, you know. So yeah. I joined like every softball team in the world and I played tennis like a like a fanatic. And, I, you know, I was never any good at basketball. I had I, football is absurd. I mean, if if soccer was a thing back then, I might have taken up soccer. But yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that athletic. I'm not that fast. I mean, I'm not no. going to be any good at soccer. And I hate the whole, I'm sorry for this revelation, but I hate the whole idea of like, everybody gets to play and everybody gets to do this. I, and it's great in principle, but you're, you're also like really, you know, if somebody's a great artist and you're not, not letting them be great because you got to have all the other kids keep up with them, you know, or, or, yes. or it's like, I don't, I don't get that. It's like, let somebody excel at what they do. And I just, I, anyway, and then find the thing that you excel at and do that. Yeah. Smoking and drinking in pubs is like a thing. <laughs> that you can excel I, was very, at, you know? I was very, very good at it. <laughs> of course. Of course. You know, um, anyway. like I said, I mean, I still body built and my, my dad, because I asked, for Christmas, I asked for a weight bench and, um, you know, a barbell dumbbell set. And it was so funny. So years later, my dad was in Seattle, you know, and I was talking, yeah, you know, I, I need to get a bench. He looked and this is the same bench I had since high school. And he looked at it and it's like duct tape at this point. And he goes, when I bought you that, I thought you would never use it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I love that. Good for you, Ann. Be careful now. People are going to want to see your technique, you know, they're going to want videos of you actually <laughs> weightlifting. Um, and then uh, eating, drinking in the movie theater. Uh, I am definitely, I mean, I have done that, but I don't, I can, I can go without while watching a movie in a theater. I don't have to have a drink. I rarely have a drink. I don't like soft drinks. Yeah. So I don't do that. Uh, and 
have to have popcorn. I don't like to get the butter on my fingers and my wife always wants butter on her popcorn. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll eat like junior mints or something because they don't make a sound when you eat them. Yeah. And that's uh, it. Yeah. Other than that, I don't care. I don't care about eating in a movie theater. I always bring my own bottle of water because I refuse to pay money for what for water. Um, but I am definitely a hot dog and a box of milk duds. Wow. I can't even I, I'm not gonna talk about milk duds. Milk duds are not your friend. <laughs> but but that's okay. I'm not, you know. My dad always ate them, so I guess that's where I picked it up from. But if I'm in a movie, I really want, and I'm so disappointed when they don't have milk duds. <laughs> I'm shocked, and I'm totally are, shocked. M M&M's and a substitute, but it's not milk duds. Well, M and M's, I can't resist M and M's. There isn't, a, there is not a mini bar that I have ever entered anywhere in the. Where I have not eaten the M and M's like yeah. almost immediately. And like it's like the science film festival where you're doing multiple movies, like peanut M and M's are really good because you just need something that'll it's a little heartier. Yeah, I'm I hear you on that one. Huh. Um, anyway, so uh, that brings us to the end of our, our of our questions for this installment. But I'm going to ask you if over the holidays you watched anything that you particularly recommend. I am going to go watch the menu. I'm going to find that and watch that uh, immediately. Good. Good. I'm glad. Um, well, I, this is a film that I just love and I showed it to my mom while I was down there, um, which is A Ghost Waits, which is intensely romantic ghost story about a guy who's goes to a house because his job is to make houses, you know, turn around houses when they're renting them out. And like his the guy sends them there to clean it up. It's like, I, don't, I, I don't know why, but, you know, people just keep leaving. These people just left all their stuff there and stuff. And it was because there's a ghost, this female ghost who's haunting it. And it's really interesting because they, they like really connect. I mean, really connect. And so it sort of turns into like a, a, a love story between this guy and her. And it was really interesting because one of the, when I was watching with my mom, I was like, man, I don't know if she's going to like the music in this or not. And it was so funny because at the end of the film, she said, oh, man, the music was perfect for that story. And I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that was not the comment I was expecting. From and her, and is this a is this an American film or it's, it's an American film? It's a micro budget film. And um, just uh, it's up on Shudder. If people have Shudder. And I just like I said, I just found the connection between the two characters because he's very isolated in his own way. And is it, is it scary? Yeah. It gets kind of intense in one, one part um, because she's trying to get him to leave the house. So, you know, she's sort of escalating. Okay. What okay, she's doing so in that sense, it is, yeah, it is scary in, in parts, but it's more, it's really focused on this developing relationship between this ghost and this guy who's there to fix the house up. I don't know how to describe it other than it, it it just touched me so deeply. Okay, I'll put that on my list. That sounds that sounds pretty good. I don't have good. shutter though. I hope no. uh I hope it's somewhere else that I can find it as well. AMC plus. Okay. Well I'll I'll huh. give it a I'll give it a try. Yeah, see if you can find it. Um I did see uh Decision to Leave, which was very highly regarded, Korean film. Okay. Uh and and I liked it very much. It's a it's a very very challenging movie that uh, it, it plays around with time. You know, it's uh it's God. I'm gonna, I'm embarrassing myself again. It's you know Park Chan Wu. I think his name is the, yeah. the guy who made uh, Old Boy and and several other really oh, good okay, yeah. films. And and uh, I I really enjoyed the movie. It's definitely a, a film noir. Yeah. Uh, okay. And. It's just it's very interesting, a very interesting take on the obsessed male and the femme fatale character. A lot of critics have, have said it reminds them very much of Vertigo, which I get why they're saying that. But yeah. it's it's not it's it, I, I don't I believe it when I heard the director say that he was not thinking of Vertigo when he was making the film. But now yeah. that it's done, he he sees the corollary. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, it's interesting. And then the other thing that that uh, Kathleen and I have started watching that is very enjoyable, uh, which and it's kind of goofy in a way, is uh, Kathleen discovered this um, network called MHZ. Oh yeah, w- yeah. And um, which I had never heard of. Leave it to Kathleen to find all this stuff because she she loves to watch foreign television. Foreign language television is like her thing. Yeah. Uh, Because, and rightfully so, I think you can actually learn more about a culture from their television shows than you you learn about it through their movies. Yeah. Especially if the movie is with a star and and things can be tweaked for international distribution, Mm -hmm. right? Whereas if it's a TV series, they don't really care. It's like yeah. they're making they're making this for the home audience in that yeah. country. And so you you get things that like really feel like that country. So yeah. we've started watching this show called um uh L'Art du Crime, The Art of Crime. Okay. And it's like a CSI set in Paris, but it's about art crimes. So, and I find this show to be very entertaining and, and kind of goofy because it's all at the same time, it's completely serious in a way that only the French can be serious about art. Uh Right. Um, It's also very funny because the lead cop has a, has, there's a term they refer to. He, he's like a hard bitten young bald headed ball of intensity uh with all kinds of problems whose marriage has gone to hell in other words he's like a classic yeah. bar character yeah. right who gets thrown off the regular police force and gets reassigned to the art crimes unit yeah. uh because he you know obviously he's an insubordinate and he punched right. his captain oh, or something yeah. you know but he suffers from this thing uh, I can't remember what it's called, and I don't even know if it's a real thing, but it's like an art phobia. Like he can't he can't comprehend art. It's like impossible for him to look at a painting and they say, what do you see? And he goes, I see men in stupid hats. You know, <laughs> uh, he's angry about everything. And he, of course, is partnered with a woman who's an art historian who is like this savant who actually speaks with famous artists yeah so you actually get actors playing the artists in conversation with her cool right so it's like she's sitting there in her office and then claude monet walks in and they start having a conversation about art history you sold me (laughs) it's it's a it's it's fabulous the last one i watched was hieronymus bosch guest appearance by hieronymus bosch and yeah. it it's just funny. Now, this is not to be confused with the American cop show named Bosch. But right. um, yes, that's a different person. Where the character <laughs> is, in fact, named for Hieronymus Bosch. But uh, it's it's just it's just a goofy show. It's so French because only the French would do this where it's like th- there's this one episode where the whole thing is about is the painting going to be destroyed? Yeah. Right. And like they go to all these lengths to try to save the painting from this madman who wants to destroy it. And you feel the, the pain more than if it was a person in the in the show who was threatened, you know? Yeah. It it's good. It's very yeah. entertaining. Yeah, I don't know I- how long it's like five seasons. I don't I think I only need one. Honestly, yeah. I get it. This the guy, the young guy who plays the lead, it's like he a little of him goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's utterly charming the actress who plays the artist or i have a huge crush on her she's yeah. fabulous yeah and i, I wanted to get a station anyway because they have a, a danish they have more than one danish series on there but they have one that i really want to see which is about a couple of retired con artists and, and i love the actor who plays the the husband in it and you know they're married they have a child but then they get into financial trouble so they have to go back to conning but then they're trying to conceal it from their kid and trying to have like a family life and balance this and they're using an old partner and it just sounds really great so i just want to see that but also it's just gonna say really quickly um there's a french series called the petite murders and um it's all agatha christie adaptations oh, so okay. they're all agatha christie stories but 
but the guy in their set, like the first series, I don't really like the series, one of the further series, but the original series, like are set be right before the war. And it's interesting because his younger partner is also gay and, and uh, so that's kind of interesting. But what I love about it is, so for some reason, it's just so hilarious to me. In the guy's office, if you look on the wall, there's a photo on the wall and it's Agatha Christie. Oh. <laughs> They but pay their good. debts. They pay oh. their debts, you know? Yeah, but I got to tell you, all the really good, the best Agatha Christie adaptations I've seen have been French adaptations of her work. Well, they, they know... They and, really and, know how to do her, her stuff. And the the other show that I was so pleased to see is on this network is uh, I finally get to see all the um, Inspector Maigret adaptations oh, uh, yeah. with, with Bruno Cremet, who is fantastic in the part. And, um, you know, he's growing on me. I've always, I've always seen Gabin, yeah. you know, in that, in, in that role, but it, he is really good. And I love the sh show, the production design, because they're all set in, you know, period, yeah. you know, when Simeon wrote them. Yeah. And, uh, and the show just looks great and it's slow, which yeah. I personally enjoy. Yeah. That, you know, it's true to the period that these mm -hmm. things develop slowly and they're not slam bang action things. They're psychological. Yes, that's yeah. Simenon, you know. Yeah. They're all psychological studies of the criminal mind. Yeah. And uh, and the delight was in discovering that Raoul Cotard, the cinematographer, photographed this series. Who wow. is legendary? You know, he shot uh, all of Jean Luc Godard's early films and Truffaut's movies. You know, he shot Jules and Jim, and um, you know, it's just it's fantastic. So the visual look of the shows is very uh, it's it's noir in color. Yeah, he, he does a spectacular job with it, with like the the Pigalle neon and all this stuff. It's just it's it's great. No, uh, and I always found in those books, I always found his relationship with his wife really moving. Yeah, it's, it's it, even That's, even when yeah. it's a show and it's nothing more than him making the. It's it's kind of like Columbo, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, even when he's just calling home to say, "I'm I won't be home tonight. It's going to be a long one." You know, you know, he's got to break somebody down in the interrogation yeah. room. And it's very sweet, just the little smile he gives, you know, no, knowing that she's going to have his food ready when he goes yeah. home and all this stuff. It's, yeah. It's very nice. I, I just have the greatest respect for Simeon as a writer. He's just, I, I don't see how you can argue that he isn't the greatest crime and mystery writer of the 20th century. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of the, how incredibly prolific he was and his ability to write detective stories and noir stories at a prodigious rate for both is is unparalleled really yeah. and so, i'll just put up one more plug in for in case of emergency which is a movie that i love and the book's fantastic yeah, yeah. it's just such a great story okay so anyway if you like what we do you know <laughs> donate to the film noir foundation <laughs> So yes, donate report. to the Film Noir Foundation. Uh, I'm I'm happy to report that uh, you know a lot of people as the year ended, a lot of people were making their last minute charitable donations, uh, and it, it's fantastic, much much appreciated. And as we are recording this, we are gearing up. We are just entered the new year and gearing yeah. up for the Noir City Festival, starting on the twentieth. Holy cow, it's less than three weeks away now. That's kind of hard to believe, uh -huh. but we we have <laughs> we have things well, I mean, on our end, we have things well in hand. Yeah. Uh, you know, my fingers are crossed that we're getting every single thing we ask for film wise. Um, but I don't want to draw the curtain back too far. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the festival. And there will be some lovely surprises uh, that we'll be pulling out. And uh, and I've been hearing that we're we are getting a lot of people coming from out of town. Yeah, I've noticed and, some comments too. Yeah, yeah, which is really really great because it would it would 
be hysterical if we ended up getting more people from out of the area <laughs> than we got people coming from San Francisco to Oakland. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, I don't know if I can cross the bridge. And it's like uh, a lot of people are crossing the country. So if yeah. you can't get your ass across the Bay Bridge, uh, I wonder what's wrong with you. And I would like to point out, because this has actually come up. So anyway, if you go to northcity.com, that is our festival page. And you can see everything is playing. You can buy tickets, you can buy a passport, which gets you into all films for a discount. Uh, but also we have a venue tab. So if you get to the top and you hit venue, it gives you directions to the theater from different places that you're coming from. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by that, you can, like, it's on the site, you know different ways you can get to get to the theater. Um, you know, for those who don't want to take BART, even though if you're from San Francisco, I don't know why you would just take BART. It's <laughs> so much easier than driving. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Yeah. I mean, I, I had dinner the other night with a woman who lives in San Francisco, and she just took the BART train to Oakland to have dinner. Yeah. We had dinner, and she took the BART train home. It was like, yes. it's a, that's a doable thing, you know? Yeah. BART is our friend. So, yeah. So, so we hope to see people at the at the festival, and this is of course the kickoff. You know, we'll be in Seattle a couple of weeks later, and passes for that festival are already on sale at SIF, uh, Seattle yep. National Film Festival's website. Okay, I, I mentioned that. Um, thank you, thank you, <laughs> and and now I'm going to go uh, have my dinner, and I'm going to uh, see if I can find the menu. On, is it streaming or is it only in theaters? No, it's streaming now. Okay, so, good. yeah, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna do that. And oh, next I'm... time I'll re I'll report back what I think. Oh, that'll be cool because I thought I thought it was a really good movie. I'm glad I saw it in the theater because it's visually stunning. Okay, fantastic. I'm I'm watching it. Okay, cool. Okay, oh, Anne, okay. we'll uh, we'll be doing this again soon. I know. Yes. So well, good to have I'm... you back. Yes, good to have you. Good to be back. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you on the next one. And hopefully we'll see some of you at the festival. And if you do see me at the festival, come say hi. I'm nice. I will say hi back. <laughs> Anne is indeed very nice. She, yeah, just don't ask her to lift any weights when you're in this. Okay. We'll see all right, you all there. soon. See you later. Bye. Bye.